There's only one other day that is like it, that comes close. You know what that is. It's your birthday. No. Actually, it's Christmas Day. Because in Christmas, we celebrate Jesus' birthday. And then on Easter, we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And those are days that give our birthday meaning. And so, actually, on the calendar, maybe the dates are a little bit off. In fact, they are off. But these are the days we celebrate. In fact, the last week, this past week on the calendar that we've just celebrated as tourism or Holy Week, 40% of the gospel narratives are focused on these last days. Like from last Sunday that we call Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they chanted, here's the king, and they waved palm branches, which came from hundreds of years before when the Maccabees had thrown out the the Romans, and they had a time of victory, and so they waved their palm branches as a sign of victory. And so when Jesus came in and they, they thought, okay, here's the new ruler. It's going to overthrow, you know, the Romans. And they called that Palm Sunday. But then the week goes on, and literally, you have four Gospels in the New Testament. And about 40% of the whole text that they deal with is these last days, from last Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, And most of it is focused on Thursday and Friday and then Sunday. And so it's amazing. The the story, you can go back and read it. I gave you those texts last week if you're interested. But on Thursday, it begins more or less with the Last Supper, what we call the Last Supper. Jesus planning it with his disciples. And then it goes through to Friday night when Jesus' body is taken down from the cross, he is dead, and they lay him in a tomb, a rock cave with a large stone covering it. And then Sunday morning, when the Jewish Sabbath is over, the story begins again. And suddenly you have the story of these women going down with some embalming spices to care for the body and to mourn. They find that the tomb is empty. And the gardener who greets them turns out to not be the gardener after all. He turns out to be Jesus. And so they run and they tell some of the disciples who are staying in Jerusalem. And Peter and John run to the empty tomb and they see for themselves, and it is true. He's alive. He's risen just as he said. And so there's a lot more details. Obviously, there's a lot to that story. And in recent years, in the past years, I've focused on different parts of it. I always get inspired and want to talk about Easter, and I start studying, and there's just so much. And so some of the years, I've just tried to pack in everything and poor people sitting in front of me. So I've got a simpler thing today. Well, I've talked about the historical arguments for talking about the resurrection. Is it possible? What happened? What do the historians say? And the science. We one year we talked about comparing the different gospel narratives, and we looked at it. And why do they tell the story? Some of the, the different things that they share. We focused on the significance of women being the original witnesses to the resurrection. And some years, in fact, lots of years, I've, we, we've told the story through multiple songs. Sometimes I just put all together too many songs, and just because they. I was hearing them. I was like, man, this is great. And, but most years we have a lot of music and a long message. We've had some great music this morning. But I want to focus just on three simple phrases. They're simple to remember. They're profound. And they're significant. But then it's just easy when you go out from here and somebody says, well, what did you guys do anyways at Christ Church? What did you talk about? Maybe you can remember one or two or three of these phrases. One is that there is a power stronger than that, stronger than death. And I'll just mention the others, but you can leave the slide there. The second one is that there is a person who is larger than life. And then the third one is that there is a promise that's more real than your circumstances. And so there's there's a power stronger than death. There's a very well-known Bible verse. 
John 3.16. Jesus told his disciples, actually he was talking to one particular disciple person at that time, but it's recorded in the Gospel of John. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. Perish means die, but have eternal life. He will not die, he will have life. And so what is the key thing there? God's love. God loved so much that he provided a way to overcome death. You know, for most people, when we think of death, in fact, probably for everybody at some point, death is just like, it's like the wall beyond which you can't see anymore. Like I have a wall in the backyard and I can't, I can hear the kids on the other side playing in the pool and my dog's barking at them and something's happening over there, but I can't see because there's a wall and death is even more than that wall because we can't even hear the people over there. Some people say they can or they, you know, I don't know, but in general, it's just like you can't see, you don't know. It's the end. Death just is so final. The person that was here is gone. And many people fear death. Death creates anxiety. All different ways we deal with death. One of the ways we deal with death is we just ignore it. Just pretend that it's, it's not out there. It's not coming for me. In the movies or in the books, death is like a person. You know, the angel of death. Or death is appearing. Remember in Harry Potter? And death comes and, and they try to defeat death and they have some tricks, but death is smarter than they are. And so there's all those dynamics. And so we personify death. We think, well, death, Paul says, is the last enemy. You can defeat all the enemies and then there's death. Well, 700 years before Jesus was the prophet Isaiah. And prophet Isaiah said in chapter 25, verses 6 to 8, there's a whole thing going on there, but I just want to share these verses. The prophet is saying that on this mountain, he's just talking about a figurative mountain, on this place where the Lord of hosts, they call him, the Lord Almighty, he will make for all peoples, all peoples, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, of aged wine, well-refined. I mean, he's just trying to imagine a feast, a potluck supper where like all your favorite foods, somebody brought them and it's just there and it's great and it's open for everybody. By the way, we do the potluck the last Sunday of every month and it just happened when we decided on Wednesday night to do an extra one. So that's why it's two in a week. It's a lot of fun to serve each other and to help each other and make friends. So Isaiah's imagining that and he says on this figurative mountain, God is going to do this thing and it's for everybody And he'll just swallow up this whole mountainside, on this mountainside, the covering, the fear, the anxiety, the darkness that's over all the people, the veil that's spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the shame of the people he will take away from the earth. So, well, you know, that's like a great statement. It's like when you read a piece of poetry and you think it's romantic, it's ideal. Wouldn't it be nice if life were like that? Like a fun movie. Wouldn't it be, you see a really great movie and you say, wouldn't it be nice if life were like that? It just like ended nicely. Well, a few years ago, they stopped making the nice movies and now like they end with doubt and concern and violence. And it's just like, you're there going, what happened? And as well, that's like life, isn't it? It's always got a surprise waiting for you. And so the prophet said, no, there's a greater reality. And in the book of Revelation, the very last chapters of the Bible, chapter 21, reinforces that a new reality is coming. We are made for more. Our final destiny is not disease and death. Our destiny is to learn to love and live like Jesus. Allow his love and his hope to fill our hearts and overflow towards the people around us. Let the light of God shine in us. That way when death comes, we can leave behind a legacy, a pathway for other people to follow. Peter said it would be like a light shining 
in a dark universe, like a star that forever after you can see and points the way. Our destiny will be to enter into a whole new reality where death and disease and sorrow and pain have been completely overcome and defeated by the powerful love of God and the powerful life of Jesus. So there's a power that's stronger than death, and that's a reality that can change the way that you think about life. Death is not the end. It's the final enemy, but death has been defeated. And there's a person that's larger than life. The same verse that we shared, John 3.16, carries on. And Jesus says in verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Many, many people who come from a church background and even some that don't have gotten the idea from their families, from the churches, from lots of places that God is probably angry. And if I were to ask you, how do you think God sees you? How does he feel about you? Most of us get a little bit nervous. Well, I don't know. I don't think he really, see, we, if we just, we don't want to go there. I found that with a lot of people. Maybe you love to go there and you're like, man, God loves me. He's great. I'm really excited. But I sort of get that feeling sometimes like when I was a kid and they told me I had to go to the principal's office at school, the director's office at the school. And I say, you need to go and you need to sit outside there in the hallway and you need to wait. And you get this, I would get this sense of like trouble. My dad would say, I want you to go up to my room and wait for me. Those were not good words. That was like, there were fear entered in like, okay. And so I actually had a fair amount of fear when I was little for lots of things. And some were from those kinds of statements and some were just like the fear of being, I, I was a bunch of siblings and we all just mocked each other mercil mercilessly, made fun of each other. And so we were kind of tough, it looked like, but on the inside is like, I hated to be laughed at. I had a fear of being laughed at. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, I can literally remember if I try, if I make any effort sitting in a classroom and I would pass the entire school year and never raise my hand with a question because I was afraid to make something that maybe someone would laugh at me. You say, man, you're messed up. Well, I didn't know it. It probably was, but we have fears. We have anxieties. Yours may be something else. Maybe you've never, if you've never suffered some kind of fear of worrying what other people think about you, and what's going on, that's fantastic. Don't even worry about it. Don't even think about it. But some people have those kinds of fears or other issues. And we think that about God. God's kind of thinking, man, I, you know, I made a mistake. There are a lot of jokes about that. Or I could have, you know, too bad. You had your chance. You messed up again. And many times I told Lisa, I hung some pictures for Lisa. And she was so happy. She said, we've been married 29 years. And it was like the first time you hung them and they were like, they hung well, you know, and, uh, and there was no problem. I was like, yeah, sure. I'll hang the pictures for you because for like 20 some years, I just hated hanging pictures. Because I'd hang them wrong, and I'd try to use, I'd use the wrong nail, and I would take a shortcut, and if I use a nail, it would poke a hole. That was all the things. If you've ever done it and made mistakes, some people just get it. My father-in-law, I love my father-in-law. He taught me a lot, but he would be exasperated. He'd be like, John. And I was like, come on, Dad. I grew up in the States. My dad doesn't fix anything. I never hung a picture in my life. And then I came to Columbia, and it's like masonry and concrete. I don't even know the words for chassels and what do they call them here? Mechas and all that kind of stuff. The, I didn't know. And so I'm thinking, everybody's watching me hang this picture. And everyone's going to come in and go like, oh, who hung that picture? It's like crooked. It's like just off. <laughs> and you know what? We can transfer those kinds of things to thinking that's how God looks at me. It's, uh, it's just a little bit off. You know, I kind of... You're doing okay, John, but I hope for something different from you. 
And the resurrection reminds us this. There's a person larger than life and God did not send him to condemn the world, to mock and to point out the flaws and to be angry and to say, uh, yeah, I, you know, you're just not getting it. But to, through his power, through his love, save the world. Jesus was larger than life. Death could not hold him. We just sang that in one of the songs because it's a truth. It's from scripture. The power of love overflowing through Jesus brought healing to the sick. The stories record that sometimes people just had to reach out and touch him. And power flowed through him and they were healed. His hands multiplied food for the hungry. His prayers brought freedom for people who are captive by demons of addiction. How many problems do we have in this society and in the society around the world with addictions and drug addictions? And we just look and we're like, I wish somebody could do something, but it's like there's no way out. And Jesus provided some ways out. And people who were enslaved by lies and spiritual darkness in his touch opened the eyes of blind people. He just reached out and touched them and he said, see, and they could see. And his words restored broken relationships and his appearance in any place drew multitudes of people. Why? The scriptures say because he spoke with authority they had never heard. He spoke words of wisdom and compassion and forgiveness. He wasn't angry. You see times in the scriptures when Jesus is angry. It is always with religious leaders. I'll be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a religious leader. But that's who Jesus shows anger and frustration and he gets upset with in the scriptures. It's not with the regular people who are messing up. He's speaking to them with compassion and love. He says, hey, I came to show you a better way. He rebuked powerful leaders. He stood up against corrupt religious institutions. And he said in John 10.10, 10, there is a thief who comes to lie and to steal and to destroy. And we've all heard that thief in our hearts and in our minds. And Jesus said, but I came so that you could have life and life more abundant, life with a capital L. Jesus is larger than life. He's larger than our imagination. And so there's a power stronger than death. There's a person who's larger than life. And there's a promise in the resurrection that's more real than your circumstances. Jesus said also in John, I took all the quotes from John, so maybe you go read the Gospel of John. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to the disciples and the people that were following him, he said, look, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. Now, that was stranger to them than it is to us. Because whoa, we, can we can be thinking and remembering and reflecting on Jesus' resurrection. We at least have a resurrection as a point of reference. But the disciples were saying... What is he talking about? I'm the resurrection and the life. What is that supposed to mean? Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. It's just like a tongue twister. It's like one of those brain games that philosophers do. Well, there are a lot of passages, particularly written by Paul, who try to explain this inspiring concept of resurrection and life. But there's an overlooked passage of Paul that I think it could be especially relevant for us today. And it's in 2 Corinthians. The letter that Paul wrote called 2 Corinthians is a letter that talk begins with and talks a lot about suffering and facing suffering, difficult times. And so often when we quote Paul, when I quote Paul, I look for, we look for the verses that are like really positive thinking. You know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Okay, we'll remember the positive ideas, the great thoughts, the winning ways. And, but there's something inside many of us that say, you know, the positive thinking isn't always enough. That'll get me through six days a week, but not seven. 
five days a week, but there's two days that I just, I need more. Not just inspiration, not just motivation, not somebody saying, you know, just smile. It'll be better tomorrow. And so I thought we should hear these words of Paul. From 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he starts out and he says, I do not want you to be uninformed, my brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia, the area where they'd just been coming through. Just coming through, not like a day, like months traveling through. Hear are his words. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. This is the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he says, you know what? I just came through a time where I just have to tell you, I despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. He said, but all I can say is I guess this must have happened so that we would not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. So many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So it gets long there. But it's saying, Paul's saying, you know what? I despaired of life itself. I felt like I was under the sentence of death. Things were so bad. You could think of a deep depression. You could think of a physical illness. You could think of a financial crush. You could think of an addiction in a family member. Some news that gets it just like takes your breath away. It's like... What is this even worth going on? And Paul's saying, you know, that happened to me. And I was there and I lived it and I felt it. And it came to the point where all the only thing I can take out of it is that somehow I came to realize I can't do this alone. I cannot rely on myself. I need God who alone raises the dead because I was as good as dead. Paul had suffered. But he learned to rely on God who ultimately delivered him. Self-reliance is a trap. Learn to pray. Ask God for guidance. Don't tell other people if they laugh at you. You can do it in private. You can pray in private. But listen. Sit in silence. Wait for his answers to come. Relationships can be damaged to the point of death. Our hearts can be broken. Our spirits can be crushed. Our physical, mental, emotional... Even our psychological health can be ruined. People go crazy. You know some of them. People even go crazy and they take their own life. We say going crazy. Like physical, mental, emotional, psychological illness can take over. And you and I can become slaves to what the scriptures call dark powers. Things like money. Slaves, yes, to money to marketing, to social media, slaves to our own egos, unmet expectations. Yet in God's power, a resurrection is always possible. In any of these situations, in all of these situations, God has the power. New life can come. Notre Dame can be restored. Your marriage, your friendship, your secret hopes and dreams, your finances, your emotions. Nothing is too difficult for God. God's love, Peter said, remember the apostle Peter? Peter wrote that God's love covers over a multitude of sins. He didn't mean, because Jesus clarified it, Paul clarified, just do whatever you want because at the end God's love is great and he'll just understand and be compassionate. What Peter meant is that during that last week, I messed up so many times, and I talked about this a week or two weeks ago. He messed up so many times, he argued with Jesus. Read the accounts. Peter, on almost every critical moment of the last week, Peter is there telling Jesus, "Uh uh-uh, it's not supposed to be this way, you should do it that way. No, you don't wash my feet. No, you don't, no, 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 no. And he got it all wrong. And then right after the resurrection... Jesus talks to these women and he says, go tell the disciples to meet me 
in Jerusalem. I want to talk to them. And I thought, I wonder if Peter felt like when the my music teacher told me, John, I need you to go down and wait at Mr. Wilder's office. You sit out there and you wait for him. When my dad said, you go up to my room and wait for me. And maybe Peter was feeling that. He had to be nervous. He had just denied Jesus. Like he had fled. The other disciples had fled. And now all of a sudden Jesus has produced this power that's like different from anything they've known before. I mean, they're as shocked as if you would be shocked and said, you know, I I don't believe this. And they're saying, I don't believe this. And the women are saying, look, he said he's coming. Go wait for him in this place. And Peter had denied Jesus. He failed to stand up for him. And he apparently, it appears that Peter was not even at the cross. He couldn't even bring himself to be there. And I don't blame him. I mean, I can totally get it. But what did Jesus do? He came looking for him. He found him. You read through the Gospel of John. He cooked him breakfast over an open fire. And with love and compassion, he spoke to Peter. He restored the relationship and he restored the man. We don't remember Peter being the broken, fearful, I really messed up guy. I can't even bring myself to talk to Jesus because I don't know what he thinks of me anymore. We remember Peter as like the rock, the guy that built the church, the 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 the, the great leader. Peter grew from that encounter to be one of the most memorable people of all time. That's a resurrection. That's not just in some other life after death. That's like in the right here and now, a person that was broken and ashamed was able to discover the compassion and love of God, stronger than death, larger than life, greater than his circumstances. You and I don't have to be memorable. We're not competing with Peter or anyone else. Just be yourself, the own, your own unique individual, individual. But the miracle of the Easter resurrection is that each one of us can be a miracle too. There's a power stronger than death. Love, God's love, compassionate, compelling, merciful, gracious. When God says, go over there and wait for me, I'll be there soon, we should get rid of the idea that he's there to point out all my flaws and to give me a scolding and whatever else. God is there to say, man, woman, child, I love you. Let me help you. Let me show you the way. There's a person larger than life. Jesus is the king. He's literally the cosmic Christ. That sounds weird because we don't say it. The cosmic Christ. In him, everything holds together. He is showing, he is sharing his light and life to show us the way to live. And there's a promise more real than our circumstances. In Christ, when we follow Christ, the best is always yet to come. We can meet him through the scriptures, the world of nature, communities of Christians who follow his ways because we're perfect. No, but because we're learning to reflect his light and life. So I want to challenge you to make your choice today, to put your energies and resources into the work of following Christ. Wherever you are, the work that you are, the family that you have, but do it being his ambassador of light and reconciliation in all the places you go, leaving a legacy of love and compassion that will outlive you and show the way for others. There was a famous British cricketer. I haven't played cricket, but some have. Some right here on the front row, second row, right? And there was a famous British cricketer. His name was C. T. Stud. That's how they remembered his name. And he encountered Christ in such a way that he devoted his whole life to mission. And a hundred years later, people still talk about this guy. And he had a famous, he wrote a poem. And the poem became a, summarized to a famous saying. And Glenn, remember Pastor Glenn and D. Yoder that came down here so many times? And they always write it on all of their letters, all their correspondence. And now Glenn's gone, and this is the reality that he left with us, these words. Only one life, it will soon be passed, and only what we've done for Christ will last. 
That's just not what we've done, but it's who we are. The legacy is who we are, the love and the light and the life of Jesus. So I'd like to pray for us and invite the musicians to come. We're going to go out with a song of He Lives. And it's a song of hope, and it's a song of joy, and it's a song of proclaiming that our greatest purpose is in knowing Christ, and our greatest hope is in following him. So Heavenly Father, as we pray this morning, as we've prayed before, just show us your way. Each person's circumstances are different. Each of us has different education and formation and background and tradition. And yet all of that becomes so much less important than the profound historical reality of your resurrection. And so I pray that we can somehow begin to grasp a small part of what it would mean to align our lives with these truths. This reality that goes beyond our our thinking and our imagination. And to know that you are the greatest of all and that you have profound purpose for us and through us in spite of what we've done, in spite of what we haven't done, in spite of our failures and shortcomings and the shortness of life. You know all about that. And so we trust our lives. We trust your purposes. And uh, we celebrate this event together as we sing these words in Christ's name. Amen.